Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. And I have to add, thank you all for joining us. Trust everyone is safe and healthy in these trying times. The topic for this episode is supermarket metering devices, TEVs. This is the sixth, if I recall correctly, in a series of presentations that will follow the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that traveled around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. While certainly at this point, we are honoring the socially distant mandate and trying to continue to be safe. But with this Tech Talk entry, we're bringing the supermarket seminar concept back and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process and we have surpassed 300 attendees at this point, which is maybe a little bit of a record for us so far. We're using Zoom to broadcast this, and hopefully everything goes without a hitch. We've got an upcoming Sporlin webinar on May 14th, 2020. It's going to cover metering devices. We'll discuss electrically actuated, electronically controlled expansion valves. That's so those types with wires hanging off of them. That's a shameless promotion on our part. So join us on May 14th. Please note here are a few instructions. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you can simply dial in with your phone. There should be a phone number somewhere on the invitation that we originally sent out that you received for this webinar. Please mute, mute your microphone and that'll help us keep this all on track. As we move along and you have questions, please type those questions in the question and answer window, Q&A window. We plan to answer those questions live. If we run out of time to answer your questions during, during this webinar, and with as many participants as we have, that might happen, we will post answers online. And just so you know, this webinar is being recorded should we run into any broadcasting problems today, you can always go back and listen to the recorded version. It will appear first on Facebook Live for your listening pleasure, and then eventually on our YouTube channel. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporlin Application Team. That gray-headed, good-looking devil on the left is me. Uh, my stunt double today and technical backup is the ever brilliant and good looking Glenn Steinkaney. He's that guy on the right. Glenn's a product manager in the marketing department, and he also collects a paycheck from Sporlin. Maybe a good time for you to say hi, Glenn. Hello, Jim, and welcome, everybody. Glenn, where are you today? Jim, I am sitting in my basement bedroom, unfortunately, far, far away from you guys. So, I hope we don't have too many issues. Well, well, see, we're doing that social distancing thing. That's that's more than six feet. So there. If you have any follow-up questions or feedback, you may contact us via our email. You see those posted up there on the slide, or you can always contact the Sporland Technical Support Team at SVD Tech Support at Parker.com or or you can call our phone number, 636-239-1111, and you can get a hold of a human in the tech support team, and they'll try to help you. This slide shows the basic refrigeration system, the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle, and there are four primary components. They are now highlighted. There's a compressor. The compressor compresses the low pressure, low temperature vapor to a high pressure temperature vapor. That condenser, uh, well, vapor rejects heat to the ambient or to air or water or whatever the, the environmental sink's gonna be for that rejected heat. The vapor condenses to a liquid and it does this under constant pressure if there's no glide in the system and it rejects the heat that's been absorbed elsewhere in the system. The metering device, this device has a small orifice, a high pressure drop, and through this device, the refrigerant changes from 100% liquid to saturated liquid and vapor mix with an associated ginormous pressure drop at a relatively constant enthalpy. 
In the evaporator, the refrigerant absorbs heat from the refrigerated space. The refrigerant boils, changes phase. It should be 100% vapor at the evaporator outlet. And today we'll be elaborating on this TEV component, this metering device during the course of this webinar. Hey, Jim, before yeah. we move on, we have a very simple question that someone asked. They said, yeah. what is Glide? Oh, wow. Well, if I'm not mistaken, isn't Glide, it's that pressure difference that occurs across the evaporator or condenser when a refrigerant is actually made up of a blend of refrigerants that don't all change phase at the same pressures and temperatures. Oh, it's kind of like when you mix up that concoction that you use, that you boil off to make whiskey. The different components evaporate at different temperatures. Ah, right. Exactly. Well, you gave a, you gave a more eloquent eloquent description of that. Hopefully, that answers your question. Glide's a complicated concept. I mean, actually, we could probably do a webinar on that on that subject alone. I agree, Jim. All right. Well, here we have. The, an overview of the multiplex rack system. This shows all the components from, from the evaporator, a bank of evaporators here, a variety of different metering devices, rack of compressors, and the condensing operation up here at the top. If I advance this slide, we kind of start zeroing in on the section that we're discussing at this point. And today we're gonna to talk about the thermostatic expansion valve, which is used as a metering device. The TEV, generically the metering device resides at the interface between the high pressure side and the low pressure side of the system, as you can see right here. The TEV's main components are shown in this example of a valve that quite frankly we've used in a variety of commercial advertisements over the years. The sensing bulb is this part of the system right here is connected to the thermostatic element by way of a capillary tube. The capillary tube is then connected to the thermostatic element assembly which you see here. These are the two halves of the diaphragm assembly that enclose it the housing rather. And then here's the lock ring, the body of the valve. Within the bowels of the valve, you'll see push rods, a pin and a port assembly, a pin and a pin carrier. This valve is fitted with a removable strainer assembly. It has ODF style inlet and outlet fittings. And then of course, there's an external adjustment assembly on this valve as well. This particular valve is conventional in design, sometimes referred to as being direct acting. It is not balance port. We'll discuss balance port a little more depth later in the presentation. Adjusting the valve, which you would do after you remove the seal cap, merely changes the preload on the closing spring and ultimately changes the superheat at the bulb location. Now, what is superheat? Superheat is the temperature of the fluid above its saturation temperature. As heat is applied to the saturated vapor, the liquid changes to a vapor at a constant temperature and pressure. And then of course, going on the premise that there's no glide, right? Right, Glenn? Yep, that's As, correct, Jim. Yeah. As, as further heat is applied, all the liquid evaporates, leaving only vapor. The vapor will increase in temperature, and that increase is essentially superheat. And the thermostatic expansion valve responds to superheat. And there are three things telling the valve what to do. There are three forces that act on the TEV to control superheat. The thermostatic bulb is mounted to the suction line and senses suction line temperature. 
the bulb pressure increases with temperature, increasing the opening force. And that's one of the three things that tell the valve what to do. The bulb generates a force to try to open it. But there's two other things, two closing forces. One sourced from the evaporator pressure or equalizer, and that's right here. And another, the closing spring pressure. I like to call it the closing spring because that helps remind me what its function happens to be. And then, of course, the resulting forces from those two independent pressures. The preload on the closing spring is adjusted to set to control the valve at a desired superheat, our so-called set point. Now it's a good time to mention the internal features of the valve that influence capacity, so to speak, and that is the length of the stroke of these push rods, the diameter of the port, and the angle of this pin are the primary valve features from an internal architecture point of view that control the capacity of the valve. Now, there's another thing that's kind of interesting to note at this point, and that's the concept of bleed, bleed ports. I mentioned port diameter back here at this point, but what is bleed port? Glenn, can you tell us a little bit about bleed ports? Sure, Jim. It is nothing more than a, a hole essentially from the high side of the valve or the inlet side to the low side of the valve, which allows both high side and low side of the system to equalize in the off cycle. This can eliminate the need for perhaps a hard start capacitor on your compressor, uh, reducing the uh, upfront costs or uh, load actually. Um, and essentially what it ends up doing is it ends up actually adding to the capacity of the valve because it opens up that port area that you just mentioned, which is one of the three uh, features that set the capacity of the valve. Interesting. Thanks for that explanation. Here's a little animation that we're going to review. Takes a little bit of time for it to get going. But here in just a second, you're going to see the thermostatic element come off the body of the valve. Now this valve is externally equalized. It's adjustable. And you will see here before too long that it has a balanced port construction. You see a single push rod there and an opening for the external equalizer. Now the strainer's coming off the valve. That strainer can be replaced or cleaned as needed. You just got to make sure before that strainer comes out or that element comes off that the valve has been isolated from system pressure. Now we get a view of inlet flow through the valve past the push rod assembly. And this is balance port construction being depicted here. And flow out the valve, as you can see there. There's a little more, oh, now the cap tube comes off. Now that's really not supposed to come off like that, but it did. And oftentimes we depict valves as you see right here without the cap tube or the bulb. And there it shows the closing force acting upwards. And here in just a second, that cap tube's come to come back on. That's kind of like putting a magic smoke back in. The seal cap just came off and we're gonna use the tool to adjust the valve. You can see there that there's preload that's been added to the closing spring. And now the seal cap went back on. That's really important that that seal cap be refitted to the valve. Oftentimes we'll go into an installation and we'll see a bank of valves and not a one of them will have a seal cap fitted to them. Here we're gonna talk a little bit about calculating superheat. The right amount of superheat helps to optimize the performance of the evaporator while also protecting the compressor. To calculate superheat, measure the actual suction line temperature and the evaporator pressure. The evaporator pressure is then converted to saturation temperature using a pressure temperature card or a pressure temperature app. Now let's say you got a refrigerant that's new on the market and you don't have a pressure temperature card. 
Glenn, do you, do you know any kind of a neat way that we could get our hands on a pressure temperature chart for a unique refrigerant? Well, Jim, uh, the Sporling uh, uh, Chillmaster app does a pretty good job of providing a huge number of refrigerants in it. So that would be a good place to start. Cool. There's, a, there's another thing that we've put out not that very long ago, and that's our virtual engineering software tool. You can use that to generate one as well, and you can get into that for free. Uh, it's got information on a lot of new refrigerants that are on the market. So there's two ways to come up with some fairly sophisticated information. Now, actual temperatures should always be larger than the saturation condition. And the difference between the suction line temperature and the saturation temperature is this thing called superheat. We have a Sporlin bulletin discussing how to use pressure temperature information as a service tool. It is form 10-135 depicted over here. And you can look on sporlin.com under literature and you can download that as well as a host of other information for our free. Now, why do we need superheat? Why is superheat valuable? Well, it's an insurance policy. It guarantees that we're sending vapor back to the compressor, vapor and not liquid. If you have consistent liquid flood back, damage can happen in a compressor by washing away the lubricant or the oil that's used inside that compressor to keep the friction down and all the moving parts. Also, a slug of liquid can do some serious damage to a compressor. Attempting to compress liquid can cause that kind of damage and break mechanical parts. Here's two examples, like a discharge reed valve or a crankcase or a crankshaft can break like you see here and here. Now, evaporator pressure. Evaporator pressure provides one of those controlling forces for the TEV and assists in telling that valve what to do. It assists in closing the valve. Evaporator pressure can be applied to the valve through an internal passage called the internal equalizer or via an external equalizer. Over here, we have an internal version depicted and here an external version depicted. The external equalizer constitutes a third fitting on the valve that allows pressure from the evaporator outlet to be externally piped to the TEV for control. That's what's depicted right here. When there's pressure drop across the evaporator, an externally equalized valve should be used to ensure the valve can control superheat accurately. Don't forget, things like distributors always have pressure drop across them to create good distribution. In fact, right behind the thermostatic expansion valve, the distributor is going to have the most pressure drop in a system typically. When a system has a distributor, or if the evaporator has relatively high pressure drop, and high pressure drop can only be a few PSI, you should always install an externally equalized valve as depicted right here. And, and this is showing 49 PSI leaving the valve, a six pound drop through the evaporator, and then 43 PSI over here. So if we sample the equalizer pressure at this point, we have 43 PSI telling the valve what to do. If we have an internal valve over here, we're sampling 49 PSI, which is telling the valve what to do. It's the wrong number. In this example, on the left with the internally equalized valve, we're essentially assuming this is a frictionless evaporator, no pressure drop, which that's impossible, but just for illustration. So the pressure is the same at the inlet and the outlet of the evaporator. So it doesn't matter where we sample that pressure. Hey, now, Jim. yeah, I was just going to ask you a question, Glenn. Well, I was going to ask you if, if, if you don't have an internally equalized valve to install in like this application, what would you do? Well, you can still use an externally equalized valve. 
you're just going to still get the same pressure difference or same pressure that you would have seen because there's very little evaporator uh, pressure drop uh, through that evaporator. So you can still use an external equalized valve, but you must connect that external equalizer to the suction line as shown on that graphic on, on this, the right hand side. Yeah. Even if you don't need it. Well, you always need it, Jim. Oh, so is that right? You, know, you mean I can't cap it? I just can't cap it? No, you can't cap it because you have to actually have that pressure acting on the bottom of the diaphragm. Ah, under here. And if you cap that off, you won't have that pressure acting. And therefore, that valve is likely to go wide open or hmm. it may not move right at all. So you can have either way, uh, a starve or a flood condition. Ah, okay. That's interesting. Now, over here, as far as identification, if there's no additional letter following the body style designation in the nomenclature and the refrigerant, refrigerant letter code, the valve is said to be internally equalized like we have depicted over here. And here you can see that internal passage from the outlet side of the valve port to the underside of the diaphragm on this internally equalized version. I get motion sickness if I move this around too fast. This means that the evaporator pressure at the inlet of the evaporator will be exerted on the underside of the diaphragm, directly opposing the valve's bulb pressure through an internal passage in the valve body. If the valve is externally equalized, like you see over here, you'll find the letter E for external in the nomenclature. This means in addition to the valve's inlet and outlet connections, there's a third small diameter fitting on the valve body. So there's the inlet, the outlet, and the equalizer. This third connection allows the pressure from a location external to the valve to be sourced as an operating force. A small diameter tube from the outlet of the evaporator is connected to the external equalizer fitting. Pressure from the outlet side of the evaporator is then transmitted to the underside of the valve diaphragm to oppose the valve's bulb pressure. So that's transmitted through this line right here and gets to the underside of the diaphragm. So like we've said before, an externally equalized valve could be used to replace an internally equalized version of the same valve. You just have to make sure to do what, Glenn? Glenn, you still with us? Sorry, Jim. Uh, yeah, you must you, make you, sure that you connect that equalizer. Awesome. Yeah, I think you went to sleep there for a minute, didn't you? Yeah. I'm Sorry, kidding. I was looking I'm at kidding. a question or two, Jim. Oh, oh, do 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 we need to offer any of those up for discussion or? Well, we, we in have good shape. One here that I think is a pretty good one. Okay, shoot. Okay. Tell me and what it is. It goes exactly with this. So what is the maximum evaporator pressure drop before you should use an externally equalized valve? Well, that's a good question. And, and you could argue that it varies somewhat depending on refrigerant in the system. But I've seen uh, charts in our literature that says if you have more than three PSI difference across the evaporator, that, that 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 mandates or that implies the need for an externally equalized valve. Do you have any information to the contrary there, Glenn? No, that sounds right to me, Jim, because if you think about it, three PSI acting on that valve could change, you know, the amount of position open very readily. So you have to actually, with with that amount, it sounds like you really should go to the externally equalized valve. Yeah. So I think that's a, and, and if there's a distributor in the system, there's no question about it. You need an externally equalized valve in order for that system to function properly and for the valve to control superheat at the bulb location like it's intended to do. Here, we're looking at bulb and equalizer location recommendations. Uh, the TEV bulb and equalizer location are very important. The TEV sensing bulb should be affixed to a horizontal, free-draining section of the suction line 
close to the evaporator outlet. The equalizer line should be piped to the top of the suction line, just downstream of the bulb, like you see here. So here's the bulb fitted to the suction line. And then here's the equalizer coming over and tapping into the suction line slightly downstream. If located upstream of the bulb, a small amount of liquid could pass through the equalizer line, causing the valve to close and starve the coil. It could influence it. Now you ask, how could that happen? Ordinarily it wouldn't, but I've seen cases where that can indeed occur. Now care should be taken to be sure the bulb is not exposed to any kind of unnecessary airflow. And we suggest that you use the provided knuckle slicing perforated brass straps that we supply for you to mount the bulb. Other methods such as using zip ties, duct tape, friction tape, super glue are not recommended. These options don't provide adequate strength nor are they good solutions for the long haul and they don't seem to tolerate the freezing and thawing processes that are going to be imposed upon these components. So there's another good depiction of this. Over here, we got that straight horizontal section of suction line. We've got the sensing bulb strapped to it nicely and it's in intimate contact. None of this six foot away from it kind of thing. I'm trying to be funny there at the expense of other things. I mean, I've gone out to job sites where there's been a complaint that the valve wasn't controlling properly. And you can see daylight between the sensing bulb and the suction line. We want the sensing bulb in intimate contact with the suction line. You can see here on the right that that contact has been compromised because we're trying to attempt to attach the sensing bulb to the suction line where there's a bushing or a coupling. And they've used tape to affix it to the suction line. That's not a good answer in the long haul. Earlier, we said there are three things that tell the valve what to do and ultimately to control superheat at the bulb location. There's a fourth thing that sometimes tries to interfere with this process. The conventional style valve has a pin acting in the port. Liquid pressure pushing on the pin causes a fourth force to also act on the pin in the opening direction. Liquid pressure, valve inlet pressure, or condenser pressure, whatever you wanna call it, can change throughout an operating system season thus causing this force to change as it attempts to drive the valve to a more open position. So we're talking about refrigerant entering the inlet and applying an opening force here to the pin as it resides in the port. In some instances, this influence could cause the TEV to hunt. A balanced ported valve, like the one depicted here, are fitted with an integral pin and push rod assembly. You can see here, push rod and pin all in one stainless steel unit. The balance port style valve balances the liquid pressure across the upper shoulder of the push rod up in this area and the lower pin surface. If those surfaces that are exposed are relatively the same, then that so-called opening force from the inlet pressure is essentially neutralized. And that fourth thing that's trying to tell the valve what to do is out of the picture. In that case, variations in liquid pressure have virtually no effect on these valves due to the similar area of those two exposed surfaces on the push rod and pin unit. Glenn, is there, have we gotten a question that might ask when would you use a balance ported valve? Because I can tell you, we try to cover both bases. We have both a wide array of conventionally ported valves as well as balance ported valves. And often 
if you're in a supermarket environment and there's a need for a replacement valve, it's usually an emergency situation. Now the Sporlin Q and BQ valves offer flexibility in inventory. And when stocking a few parts for that emergency, you can handle that emergency. The Q body, which is shown here on the left, is conventional in design. You can see there are six different body styles. They're internally equalized, externally equalized. Some have sweat fittings, some have flare fittings. We even have the removable strainer versions. There's seven different capacity cartridges and a wider range of thermostatic element assemblies. Now the element assemblies that are depicted here all have four shortened cap tubes just for illustration purposes. The BQ over here on the right, we've got a similar array of six body types, flare, sweat, and removable strainer versions is depicted here. We have five cartridge capacities available and the same style of thermostatic element assemblies. Now, the cartridges are not interchangeable from one body to the other. Building these valves is relatively simple. Choose the body based on your needs. Do you need a flare, sweat, internal, externally equalized? Do you want the removable strainer? Select the thermostatic element, that's this component, based on system refrigerant and the evaporator temperature. The application will help to decide what you select here. Then select the appropriate cartridge based on evaporator capacity. Again, you have five from which to choose here and seven on the queue. Finally, apply oil or lubricant to the cartridge O-ring. There's an O-ring on both of these cartridge styles. Make sure the cartridge is seated fully before installing the thermostatic element assembly. Once hand tight, tighten the element an additional one sixth of a turn and assembly is complete. I'd even go on to say even a caveman. I mean, even Glenn or I could do this. I agree with that, Jim. Awesome. Now here's a little more of a discussion on the issue of capacity. Nominal TEV capacity is affected by three external factors. Evaporator temperature, liquid temperature at the inlet to the valve, and pressure drop that is available across the valve. Now we could also go into a discussion of flow rate and that refrigerating effect. That's probably a good subject for another webinar. Now take note, the lower the liquid temperature and the higher the pressure drop across the valve, the more impacted from a high, from a bit, from an increase will be the capacity of that valve. For example, nominal capacities for the R407 series and R404A based refrigerants utilize 4D degree F evaporator temperature, 100 degree F liquid refrigerant temperature and 100 PSI pressure drop across the valve. Those are, how should I say, constrained numbers that most manufacturers utilize for that reference point. Now they're essentially air conditioning style conditions, but if those conditions vary, TEV capacity will go along with it and change accordingly. For example, 4010A and 134A, the nominal pressure drop across changes from 100 PSI to 160 PSI and 60 PSI respectively. And you got to watch me. I might have transposed numbers there. I meant to say 410A. I might have said 401A. So forgive me on that. Liquid temperature and pressure drop correction factors are shown in this chart. Now, just so that we know where we are, we've just finished slide 20 of 39 to go. We're doing nicely here. Adjusting superheat. Now we've talked a little bit about adjusting superheat so far, but superheat can be adjusted on TVs with an adjustment assembly. You simply have to remove the bottom cap or the seal cap. Actually, you remove the seal cap. 
If you remove the bottom cap, that's this piece here. You're in, you're in potential, potential trouble, but we're gonna take the seal cap off. That's this contraption right here. Models such as the EG, the C and the S, all are fitted with a packing gland. And you gotta loosen that nut. And that's what we show going on right here. And we give these little wrenches away from our wholesale network. You loosen that nut and then you can then use that same tool to make incremental adjustments, a quarter to maybe a half turn, then let the system settle out for 15, 20 minutes before attempting further adjustments. Then you wanna go back and re-tighten that packing nut like we show depicted here. That's important. If the seal cap, that's the seal cap, if that's not reinstalled and tightened, system refrigerant will very likely leak out of that interface. That seal cap uses a knife edge joint to seal and it constitutes the final seal mechanism and prevents any system refrigerant from leaking from this assembly. Now here we depict two different styles of adjustment assemblies that we've fitted over the years to different types of valves. On the left here, we show the EG valve. Now, it has a rising stem style. It's threaded through the body of the valve. That stem tip moves up and down and you can see this entire assembly will disappear into the bowels of the valve as it's turned clockwise. Over here on the right, we have the non-rising stem that this stem height remains fixed once you remove the seal cap to gain access to it. And the stem is threaded to a lower spring guide, which travels along the length of this assembly. Both apply preload to the closing spring, whether it's in this instance or here. Both adjust, help you to adjust the setting of the valve. But you have to be careful when adjusting these valves. Patience is a virtue. You need to let the system settle out and don't abuse the valve by over tightening the adjustment mechanism in either direction. Here we kind of show that in some instances you can take what would have been a non adjustable valve, which you'll encounter at some point in the field, because sometimes OEMs will fit non adjustable valves for a variety of reasons to a system. Uh, Glenn, are you still with me? I am with you, Jim. How there, are you doing? I'm, I'm just awesome. Is, do you, can you think of any good reasons why a non-adjustable valve would be fitted to a system? Well, a lot of times OEMs are looking at their cost on, and providing a, a product that has good first costs, not understanding necessarily the implications for the service person down the road. So that's usually why we see it a non-adjustable valve being used. Okay. Well, if you do encounter it and you find that there's a need to convert that valve, well, we make bottom cap kits for non-adjustable valves that can be fitted to these assemblies and then allows you to adjust the superheat without replacing the valve itself. To install an adjustable bottom cap kit, if there's enough, enough flexibility in the refrigerant lines for you to reposition the valve so that the valve is now oriented in the position that you see depicted here, it makes the job much more executable, if you will. So there you'd remove the non-adjustable bottom cap like you see here and replace with the new parts as depicted over here. You're going to retain the closing spring. You're going to retain the pin and the pin carrier and the push rods. But if we have the valve pointed up to the sky, as we depict here, you can get these parts back into it and they'll be in the uh, appropriate alignment. If the valves on its side are upside down, that becomes extremely difficult to manage. Of course, then you'd have to go through the superheat adjustment procedure that we outlined earlier. This select slide shows the non-adjustable to adjustable side by side. 
and shows the differences in the parts. The bow body, essentially the same, push rods, pin and carrier, closing spring, all can be the same parts. It's when we get to the bottom cap on down that the parts diverge and are quite different. If you're making a conversion from non-adjustable to adjustable, these would be parts that would no longer be needed. Number of turns within a valve. Once you've installed a Sporlin TV, it's sometimes handy to know the total turns of adjustment that might be provided with any given valve. Knowing the total number of turns on a valve will help prevent over adjustment of that valve. Each valve type has its own specific number of approximate turns. Therefore, it's important to know the valve type, and you could use a table like we've depicted here to determine the total number, number of turns. Where would you find that table? Well, we've got something called quick tips in a form 5-220. You'd find that on the Parker Sporlin website under HVACR educational material. You can download that literature as well as a lot of other information for free. The valve type is identified by the first set of letters in the part number, and that's generally stamped into the surface of the valve body. Now, one word of caution here, you never want to force the adjustment stem in either direction. Exerting too much force at the adjustment stops on either end of the adjustment range can result in damage to the adjustment mechanism. You can always contact our tech support department for help with your specific valve. They'll require any information you can give to them from the markings on the valve in order to help you. But you see here, we've got kit designations on this side, a variety of valve types, and the approximate number of complete turns that are fitted in the various valves. Thermostatic charges allow the TEV to control superheat for the specific evaporator temperature. For medium temp coolers from a plus 50F to a minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the C charge is oftentimes used. As you see here, it says for medium temp coolers, this being the evaporator temperature. The Z charge is typically applied for low temp freezer applications anywhere from say zero down to minus 40. Something good to know, it's a comment down here. Some OEMs have attested, attested and applied the C charge to even lower temperature applications. The C charge, as you'll see in the next slide, has a, a great deal of flexibility associated with it. And sometimes, another subject here, conventional units may also use MOP type charges, maximum operating pressure type charges. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Here's a plot of superheat versus evaporator temperature. Note the C charge has a very flat superheat characteristic curve. That's what you're seeing right here. At colder evaporator temps, the superheat rises just slightly, and this makes it a good charge for use in dual temp applications. Some OEMs have tested low temp freezers with the C charge down to a limit of maybe minus 20, and have found their performance to be successful. In the distant past, we used to tell OEMs that they had to make a choice. If they wanted to control the low temp side in a dual temp application, they needed to go the route of the Z charge. If they were more concerned about the medium temp application, well, then that's why we had this C. C is in Charlie charge. But we found that the C is a pretty good answer if we're not going too deep into the low temp realm. Pressure limits. Sporlin MOP are maximum operating pressure charges limit the suction pressure returning to the compressor under high load situations. In a way, it acts somewhat like a crankcase pressure regulator. Often this feature is beneficial on a conventional system, you know, one compressor, one evaporator type system, where additional compressor horsepower is not available during high load situations. When a rack system experiences high load, another compressor can be brought online to lower the suction pressure. The MOP feature is generally not required on most rack systems, although some manufacturers have used these in the past. The thermostatic bulb has a limited amount of liquid in the bulb. 
when high suction temperatures occur, the liquid will eventually be boiled away, leaving only vapor. Without liquid to continue boiling, the pressure plateaus in the bulb, ultimately limiting the suction pressure back to the compressor. Now, a little on troubleshooting TEVs. To begin the troubleshooting process, it's always handy to know things like the high and the low side pressures and the refrigerant that's in the system. Beyond this basic information, it would be darn handy to know things like superheat and subcooling. That may very well be a stretch, but it's most useful if we're going to attempt to troubleshoot a system and analyze any kind of failure mode. You keep in mind an EPR or an EEPR may affect the suction pressure on rack systems. You know, when TEVs are not performing as desired, they can indeed overfeed or flood, underfeed or starve or haunt. Now, here we depict a list of high superheat and low suction pressure causes. And one of the common things that appears in almost every instance is contamination in the form of moisture, dirt, wax, high superheat adjustment, charge migration with an MOP style charge. I'll talk a little bit more about that briefly. On the next slide, the thermostatic element is dead, you got the wrong charge. There's that equalizer coming back into play. The equalizer has been incorrectly located. We got a restricted or a capped equalizer. There's not enough refrigerant charge. There's no subcooling. Low pressure drop available at the TEV, which could occur due to inadequate charge in the system. Or we simply got the wrong TEV installed. Hey, Jim. Yeah. We did have a question about that uh, low pressure drop at the TEV. Yes. So let me come back up here to that question and I'll read it out and okay. we'll try and get that answered. All right. So what is the minimum pressure difference across the TEV evaporator uh, in the liquid line? to make it work properly? Well, that's kind of a, that's a little bit of a loaded question. I'd say in most instances, what I'm going to do with parameters that I have on a given system is I'm going to model them. I'm either going to go to our tabulated data and see how that mandates or, or recommends a particular thermostatic expansion valve size. Uh, you can use things like our virtual engineer software program to do the same thing. But if I was asked to put something of a rule in thumb a place, I would say something along the lines of about 50 PSI differential is sort of a minimum. So essentially you need enough pressure differential to actually achieve the proper evaporator temperature. Kind of works that way. Okay. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Good question. Now, Another troubleshooting technique here, if we suspect that charge migration is taking place, the MOP type charges can sometime contribute to that. Remember, there's a limited amount of liquid in these thermostatic charges. And charge migration occurs when an MOP style element becomes colder than the sensing bulb. In other words, the element over here on top of the valve is colder than the suction line and hence the sensing bulb. And what does refrigerant like to do? It likes to rest in the coldest part of the system. And in effect, the sensing bulb, the cap tube, and the element assembly are their own system. So there is a limited amount of liquid constituent installed in this. And if this is colder than the bulb, that charge constituent will come over here and res reside. Now it's not applying pressure to the bulb. It's not applying opening force to the valve itself. Now this can happen in package equipment that's located outdoors in a cold environment where you might have an air conditioning load in a case of an auditorium or some type of exhibition hall that's operating throughout the course of the year. Refrigerant that should be in the bulb could then essentially migrate to the element and can no, no longer control the operation of the TEV because the refrigerant's always looking for that coldest spot in any given system. To diagnose charge migration in this instance, you could simply warm the element. This shows it being depicted by being warmed with a warm rag. If you hear a surge of refrigerant flowing through the valve, you might have undercovered the problem. 
Now, the system would need to be modified in some ways going forward to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You could do things like insulate the element. I've even seen heating elements applied. You could also change to a different style of thermostatic charge if that can be tolerated. Hey, Jim, before you go yeah. on, we had another question. And it's, what is the difference between a Z and ZP charge? And if I understand this correctly, a ZP charge, which means it's an MOP charge, yeah. would have a very small amount of that uh, charge constituent in it. That's correct. So that it does, it, uh, does its function. Whereas the P charge would have much more of that refrigerant. Right. And it would not, uh, would not, uh, wouldn't be sub, it wouldn't be subjective to a charge migration failure type mode right? or malfunctioning type mode. No, that's right. That's, that's kind of the difference between the two. Between the two. And, and, and in effect, the subject of maximum operating pressures could in and by itself almost be a webinar. Exactly. Yeah. So we're moving on to the next stage here, troubleshooting, identifying a so-called dead element. What's a dead element? Uh, essentially, that's an element assembly where those magic constituents, whether it's MOP or otherwise, have escaped, sort of like the magic smoke getting out of an electrical system. You can't put it back in. So if those refrigerant constituents have leaked out of the element assembly, there's no way for that bulb to generate a force to ultimately open the valve. Now, what you could then effectively do is remove, if you suspect that's the case and you've been able to diagnose it, the thermostatic element or power head can be removed once the TUV has been isolated from system refrigerant pressure. You get that off and you can move the buffer plate or you hear an extreme amount of rattling. That might be indicating the thermostatic charge may have indeed escaped. Low superheat and high suction pressure conditions. In other words, an overfed evaporator. Here's some potential causes. Excessive seat leakage. Now, a bleed port in a valve will act like seat leakage. It's like predetermined and designed seat leakage. Or you've got the wrong adjustment. You've done a poor job of installing the bulb. It's being influenced maybe by discharge air. You got the wrong type of charge. Ah, here's contamination coming in to play once more. The external equalizers in the improper location. For instance, it may be downstream of an EPR and it's being influenced by that. The valve could be too big or the compressor might have low capacity and they're not a good fit. TV hunting. Some interesting things here. Low load could have an oversized valve, oil logging, poor airflow, poor refrigerant distribution. And distribution is something we'll cover in another presentation because that's a subject all into itself. We've covered quite a bit of material here. And any one of these individual subjects could almost all be a webinar onto themselves. But one of the Last things I'd like to cover here is something about TEV identification. Now, this is depicting a non-current valve, non-current construction. You can see that by way of the style of the removable strainer and the seal cap that's fitted to this type EG valve. This is a valve that we've used for many years in a lot of our advertisements. And complete description of a Sporlin TEV includes information about the body type. That's straight through construction, it's a bar stock, um, things of that nature. Refrigerant that's going to be in the system. Does it need to have an external equalizer? About the capacity and tons of refrigerant. At one point in time, we would, we would impress the port size of the valve here into the brass body of the valve. Type of the thermostatic charge that's needed. Is there the need for a bleed port? Glenn talked about bleed ports a little earlier. We do supply bleed ports on a great number of valves. How about the inlet and outlet connection, the sizes and the type? 
length of the cap tube. Now keep in mind, this one is foreshortened just for illustration purposes. And then any prefix letters or numbers, if any are applied there and a prefix might be indicating a removable strain or assembly. There was a time where we processed orders simply based on the valve description because we didn't have item numbers because we didn't have computers that had the memory space available to handle that. I've gotten my internal staff here who usually is residing in the room telling me that I'm running out of time. So I'm going to simply say we're wrapping this up. You can view an encore performance of this webinar on Facebook and eventually on YouTube. It'll appear on Facebook page first and on the YouTube channel a little later. Eventually, they'll be out there for you to view again and again or to see for the first time. You can see here that we've got our technical support contact information advertised as well. If you have any further questions, and we only have a couple of minutes left that we could cover a question, if you post a question, we don't answer it live. We will, we will post an answer to it that you can access later on. And again, this thing's being recorded. Finally, I'll say to remember to join us on May 14th, 2020. We'll talk about electric expansion valves. And just so that you know, I like to refer to those as electrically actuated, electronically controlled valves. Believe it or not, it'll be May 14th before you know it. And hopefully we've got some of the safety issues we're dealing with now behind us. And hopefully you all stay healthy. I'm going to say this concludes our presentation for today. I thank you immensely for joining us. We've had a record attendance at this one. And if you have any questions, we're not able to answer them here in this format. By all means, we will post an answer to you online. You can go back and listen to this later. Thank you very much. You've just completed another Sporland Chill Skills Tech Talk session.